Hello and welcome to Writing on Games. In a world where game companies are seemingly raring to reveal as much about their wares as possible in order to get the inevitable pre-order bundles in front of people's eyes, there's maybe something to be said for restraint, for maintaining some of that mystery and keeping people guessing about what a game actually is. Revealed at E3 2017, Transference, a collaboration between Ubisoft and Spectre Vision, managed to pique my interest in just such a way. From the start, this game was hard to pin down. In a genuinely eerie and surprisingly meta trailer, you had real film actor Elijah Wood and the other real founders of their real film production company framed as some kind of uncanny family portrait, discussing the use of VR to explore the fake data of a fake doctor played by real film actor Macon Blair, whose performances in Blue Ruin and Green Room helped contribute to two of the most gripping thrillers I've seen in recent years. It's a trailer that blurred the lines between between what was real and what wasn't, the visual glitches calling to mind the schlockiness of VHS era horror, as well as foregrounding the artificiality of it all. Is this actually a game? Is it a VR title? They're saying it is, but who are they in this scenario? Far from the picture you perhaps form in your head when envisioning celebrity involvement in video games, here you saw people coming from a place of real understanding with regard to subverting expectations in the world of film, with their company now being provided the resources by one of gaming's biggest entities to realise that understanding in a completely different medium. And then, outside of another appearance at the following E3, it was relative silence from that point. No one was talking about this game, to the point that by the time a Ubisoft rep reached out to me about review code, I had completely forgotten it existed. That said, the sparse marketing campaign had worked to some extent. I jumped at the chance, I needed to know what the hell this game actually was. As it turns out though, the reality of my experience was far less difficult to categorise. I received the game, played for around an hour and a half, rolled credits on a particularly generic walking sim with allusions to incredibly well-worn sci-fi and horror tropes, with Macon Blair giving a performance that was fine despite a dramatically unremarkable script, predictable jump scares, and expected bait and switch, oh it turned out to be the dog running past jump scares all being present and accounted for. And then you begin to realise why no one was talking about this game. At the end of it all I felt neither joy for having reached the end, nor any particular anger that I'd wasted a bit of my time. Mainly confusion as to how much genuine star power was thrown behind such a mysterious project that ended up so nothingy, so grossly inoffensive. It's a game that wants to be viewed as way loftier, more cerebral than it actually is, presenting you with scenarios that initially seem tantalisingly cryptic, only for the eventual answer to be anything but. I would find myself trapped in a kitchen, trying to figure out the location of a key to unlock a door that seemingly didn't exist. In true adventure game fashion, I found myself interacting with every combination of items I could find. After 20 minutes of exploring a worryingly vast stretch of my time with the game, I became frustrated wondering what Transference could possibly want from me. In retrospect, it was perhaps the most memorable part of my experience. I was frustrated, but at least it got a reaction out of me. It got me thinking outside the box. Maybe the game wants me to cut the wires, to mess with the program, really shake things up in the way the trailer made it seem like we'd be doing, but nope, the key was right there, in an area I'd already explored multiple times, the screen just wasn't bright enough to see the precise pixel I needed to click on. It was an automatic process, it required nothing of me and ended up getting nothing out of me. And it's an automation that continued throughout my gameplay. Another puzzle, for example, has you turning the hands of a clock to match the position of two other clocks, but wait, one has numbers displayed as equations and the other is turned on its side a little. It's still just matching the position though, the answer is staring you in the face not once but twice. One of the game's most prominent and long run puzzles is finding the five letter password to a child's room, and this might have been a brain teaser 
user if there wasn't a five letter word just scrawled in huge bolded writing immediately next to the door. And once you notice that, you just collect the pieces presented to you as the story goes on without much input needed. The game is posited as an escape room, and if that's accurate, it's one that straight up tells you how to leave, you're just waiting for the door to open. Of course, this might be excusable if the automation of the gameplay was in service of its story, and indeed the presentation of its narrative is potentially compelling, mostly forgoing a traditional structure in favour of a more surrealist approach, bordering on stream of consciousness as you explore a snapshot of each family member's perspective, that you almost literally piece together as you go along. The game's corrupted operating system aesthetic mirroring the fragmented, dreamlike nature of the memories you're inhabiting. It's an interesting concept for sure, let down by a story that's nothing you have not seen before. Its mad scientist turns out to be massive dick to his family, and combined with the game's kind of unbelievably short length, either a positive or a negative depending on your perspective, the whole thing ends up feeling fairly inconsequential as a result. The kid's room you enter after figuring out the password after so much time is just a room, the monster is just a monster. You know, what if the corrupted mind discussed in the trailer was corrupted before they put on the headset, man? What if the dog running at you was black to represent the black dog of depression, man? The genuine blurring of lines between reality and fiction as explored in the game's reveal are reduced to some bits of the game are rendered in engine and some are FMV, I guess. And it's important to reiterate that Transference seems like it was made specifically for VR. Not only are said options heavily foregrounded in the menu, but the marketing spoke of a revolutionary new implementation of the technology. The story centres around a device designed to have you enter someone's consciousness, a realm of reality that's not your own. And perhaps exploring that reality is more tactile, the jump scares more immediately visceral, if the spooky things are running directly at your your face. But the bigger problems that this game has, the non-interactivity, the woeful puzzle design, if you can even call it that, the inconsequential nature of the whole thing, I don't think any of it would necessarily be solved by wearing the screen on my eyeballs. And it's a shame because as much as it's easy to disregard the involvement of movie stars and games as some kind of intrusion from those that don't get the medium, there's a reason people were so excited for a collaboration between Kojima and Del Toro for instance. There are elements of cinematography, screenplay, world building, so much that the medium of film has to offer the world of games and vice versa. Like so many attempts to merge the two in the past, however, Transference comes across as neither a set of engaging systems or puzzles designed to tax the player, nor the story I know the people involved are capable of telling. At least if I'd outright hated it, I could say that it had done something bold enough to get a reaction out of me. As it stands though, and not unlike the device at the centre of its plot, Transference serves as just another failed experiment to add to the pile. So I hope you enjoyed my piece on transference, as always I'd like to thank my patrons who allow me to dedicate the time necessary to producing these videos, and in return get access to goodies like episode soundtracks and new patron exclusive written articles. If you like the videos and feel like you want to get involved, why not check it out? Special thanks go to Mark B Writing, Rob, Michael Wolf, Artyom Vitsyuk, Timothy Jones, Laserpferd, Cole Mandel, Spike Jones, The Nameless Guy, Chris Wright, Dr Motorcycle, Ham Migas, Travis Bennett, Zach Matt Casserly, Samuel Pickens, Tom Nash, Shardfire, Philip Lange, Anna Pimentel, Jesse Rhine, Brandon Robinson, Justin's Holderness, Nico Blakely, Matthew Naturey, Christian Kuneman, Nicholas Ross and Charlie Yang. And with that, this has been another episode of Writing on Games. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you next time.